stocks and help you pick the right stock at the right time. Good morning, you're watching Daybreak on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First, the headlines this morning. Asian stocks are off to a weak start on the final trading day of the week. Oil prices were flat and so were the euro and pound. The European Central Bank called time on its bond buying program. President Mario Draghi said that the risks to the euro area economy are worsening. The Telecom Appellate Tribunal set aside the predatory pricing guidelines that placed restrictions on service producers except Reliance Geo. The TDSAT has asked the TRI to consider the provisions within the next six months. After a two-day impasse, the Congress party has chosen Kamal Nath as the next Chief Minister of Madhya Pradesh. The party will pick CMs for Rajasthan and Chhattisgarh today. And the Central Board of the Reserve Bank of India will be meeting today under the new RBI Governor Shakti Kanta Das, even as concerns over the bank's autonomy remain. Let's talk about what happened in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S. markets, U.S. stocks closed mostly lower after making small moves in and out of positive territory as investors continued to fret over the lack of clarity and progress in U.S.-China trade talks. Bloomberg Sue Keenan wraps up all that transpired in Thursday's Wall Street session in this report. U.S. stocks drifted lower in the latest session. The S&P closed virtually flat. The Dow eked out again, and the Nasdaq was lower, with the big declines coming in the small caps for Russell 2000. Once again, the trade headlines weighed on stocks, and strategists say where before we'd seen an investor strategy of buying on the dips, we're now seeing a new technique of selling on the rifts. In other words, every time the stock market starts to rally, investors come in and sell. Meanwhile, the dollar jumped after the European Central Bank sounded a cautious note on growth, and U.S. jobless claims came in lower than expected. In terms of stocks that advanced, we saw utilities and companies like McDonald's and P&G rise, while banks and retailers again took hits. And notably, a badly beaten up former industrial General Electric, it's down almost 60 percent year to date, it surged as the biggest bear on the street, J.P. Morgan Chase, removed its two-year-old sell rating and upgraded GE to a neutral. In terms of treasuries, they were little changed, and strategists say that a lot of bond investors continue to focus on the Fed, the economy, and what's ahead with interest rates, while the trade headlines continue to weigh heavily on stocks. That has happened for a while, the strategist says, and it continues to happen now. In New York, Sue Keenan, Bloomberg News. All right. Well, that's how the U.S. markets ended. And that pretty much gave us a, a cue about what would happen in Asia. And that's more or less panned out. Let's go straight across to Bloomberg's Rosalind Chin, who's joining us live from the Hong Kong studios. Uh, Rosalind, seemingly a risk-off tone that start at the start of trade today. Morning. Good morning. You're right. Risk off t uh, tone indeed. Investors look like they dipped a little bit of a toe into risk on waters. But yes, now hastily retreating again. The uh, markets here are in the red this morning. So we've got the MSCI Asia Pacific Index losing by about 1% so far. Now we have had some data already this morning. We had some Tanken numbers out of Japan. And that was really a little bit murky there. The outlook for large manufacturers dropping to the lowest since mid-2017. They did seem to remain optimistic. But trade concerns clouding that outlook for manufacturers there in Japan. So we've got the Nikkei down by 1.4% right now. Uh, we've got uh, the Kospi leading uh, lower as well, with Samsung leading that uh, the declines there. In Hong Kong, we've had an IPO this morning, Fosun Tourism Group. Uh, that, uh, unfortunately, also falling at the open. It's um, down by 1.4% at this point on its first day of trading. Uh, the Hang Seng itself down by 1.25. We're expecting some more data out of China today. We've got China industrial production numbers and, of course, uh, November numbers for retail sales data. The yuan is uh, weakening a little bit on that, dipping ahead of that data coming out right now. The uh, offshore is at uh, 1.8875 uh, to the U.S. dollar. Overall, though, Citigroup, despite the seeming doom and gloom here, does say buy the dip. Now, for the first time since Donald Trump was elected, 
profit forecasts for the next year, says uh, Citigroup, are being lowered as doubts grow about global economic growth. But Citi says, you know what? You should buy the dip. Don't worry about earnings. Actually, they're going to be better than you think. So. <laughs> take what you will uh, out of that advice going uh, into the end of the year but uh, at the moment the markets here in Asia definitely in the red back to you absolutely thanks so much for that Rosalind but well, let's talk about one of the big updates from last evening and this one from Europe one by one the big central banks are edging back to something that feels like normalcy following the lead of the US Federal Reserve the European Central Bank announced that it would halt the program of quantitative easing on which it embarked on in 2015 amid a seriously weak economy. Bloomberg's Kathleen Hayes highlights all the details from that uh, announcement in this report. After four years and $3 trillion worth of bond purchases, Mario Draghi confirmed it's over, but at the same time, He's worried. He's worried about um, geopolitics, protectionism, a.k.a. trade war, stock market volatility, fragility of um, emerging markets. So, but that said, he's still confident in the consumer pushing the economy forward. So let's jump into the Bloomberg, a hashtag GTV chart, so you can see, uh, I think, a, a good big picture view of what we've been seeing lately in the euro economy. Because what we're seeing is these green bars getting smaller this year. Eurozone quarterly GDP growth, okay? It has definitely been on a downturn as are or is the Eurozone Purchasing Managers Index, a gauge of manufacturing but is seen as closely tied to the overall direction of the economy. Now, Bloomberg Economics um, says, yes, that these were dovish remarks and that this means that instead of a September rate hike, we may see the ECB waiting until December to make that long-awaited move. As for other central banks, Switzerland, Norway, held their policy steady, but they are concerned about risks as well, threats uh, for considerable damage uh, coming from around the world. The Bank of France cut its growth forecast. Of course, it's worried about the protesters who are concerned about uh, rising gasoline prices and more, so that's what they think is going to cut their economy. But at the same time, the PBOC m mentioning um, in their review of the economy and their challenges, they're facing headwinds. Headwinds to be sure, trade war and other things. So I think it's an interesting context uh, bringing up the Federal Reserve to see how that that will fit into their discussions at this big, big meeting Tuesday, Wednesday, when they're expected to raise that key rate once more, but then send us some very important signals about what they will or won't do next year. All right. Uh, some of those comments by ECB uh, President uh, Mario Draghi having some bearing on the currencies, uh, especially the dollar, which is viewed as safe haven. But with that, let's turn to uh, the Indian markets. Now, Darshan mm -hmm. Mehta is joining me to tell you all about the trade setup for the day and also to tell you what's happening in the futures and option space. Darshan, there's that RBI board meeting. We'll be waiting for updates from that. But broadly, looks like it's a bit of a weak start for us this morning. It is, it is. Uh, because uh, global queues were muted, nothing coming in from, uh, from the US. But surprisingly, the Asian markets are weak. The Japanese markets are down over 1%. And the SX Nifty, till, till you know, around 15, 20 minutes ago, was trading in the positive, has suddenly cracked and come down by almost uh, 250 points. So that's uh, the SX Nifty for you. Uh, uh, we will go below the 10,800 mark in trade today. As far as ADR is concerned, most of the ADR, in fact, all the ADRs ended with a positive bias. There was traction that was seen on the IT names, Wipro as well as Infosys. Both of them were up in trade. HDFC Bank continues its strong run on the ADR side. So all the ADRs ended with a positive Bias. Yesterday also was a decent day. We ended off days high, but nevertheless, uh, the Nifty managed to move up by almost uh, half a percent. An equal amount of traction was seen on the mid-cap and the small-cap end of the market also. How did uh, the Nifty Bank pan out in trade? The Nifty Bank was up almost six-tenths of a percent, and the outperformance of the PSU Banking Index has managed to continue. As far as uh, the front flows are concerned, FIs bought in uh, 675 crores. DIs were net sellers to the tune of 62 crores in the cash market. As far as the uh, markets are concerned, the Nifty was up 53 points. Uh, basically, a lot of banks, uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank and HDFC Bank, were the prime reason why there was traction. Infosys contributed. On the negative side, you had TCS as well as Yes Bank. Yes Bank uh, was up in trade uh, till morning, but uh, once the news came in that there was no clarity on the board meet and who could be the next uh, chairman, uh, the counter did manage to fall in trade. As far as the FNO markets are concerned, uh, what we saw as far as the Nifty was concerned, very muted open interest build up, but still on the long side. On the Nifty Bank, if you're looking at it, open interest build up uh, was, was down almost 8%, indicating that there was a bit of short covering that was seen on the Nifty futures. Uh, we are close to the 10,800 market trade and that's where majority of the open interest build up is seen at this point of time call writers
writers are active from 10,800 to high levels and put writers from 10,800 uh, to lower levels. But uh, 10,500 to 11,000 is the broad range that the market is looking at. As far as what happened in trade yesterday, you could clearly see that you know it was the put writers that were active in trade from 10,600 to 10,800 but higher levels call writers have started writing in and took positions at lower level they were forced to share positions since the market did manage to rally. Uh, the two stocks in the FNO band remain uh, there is no change to that the nifty PCR and the bank nifty PCR let's pull that up the nifty PCR moved in much higher to 1.51 from 1.47 look at the bank nifty PCR and that moved in lower to 1.25 from 1.44. Uh, stocks that uh, actually moved on high open interest build up uh, and that moved first of all you had PC dwellers which was up almost 18% and open interest build up of 15% rest of the other counters uh, despite seeing high open interest build up were rather muted in trade in fact Berger paints and container cops of fresh short positions but the trade uh, was rather muted in terms of stocks which saw open interest decline you had Bank of India which saw open interest build, build down of 10% and saw short covering that came in Indian banks saw short covering that came in was up 5% so PSU bank has a lot so a lot of short covering that came in trade yesterday thanks so much for that Darshan well let's uh, shift focus now and speak about commodities Yash Upadhyay is joining me with all the updates good morning Yash uh, what do you have for us this morning morning Alex so a bit of a bounce scene in crude oil prices as they uh, gain more than 2% on on Thursday as Saudi state controlled oil companies uh, warned US refiners to brace for a steep drop in cargoes from next month in an effort to cut uh, a pricing price killing uh, building or uh, building up of the American stock price additionally prices were supported uh, on account of a report from the International Energy Agency that global supplies uh, may be more fragile than previously thought because of unplanned supply losses from Iran and Venezuela as well as reports of a large drop in stockpiles as the, at the US storage hub in Oklahoma. Uh, as far as base metal space is concerned, uh, strong gains coming through for the likes of nickel and tin ending the day higher by half a percent each. Uh, copper ended marginally higher on Thursday and is on track for its first weekly gain uh, in three weeks uh, amid easing trade war tensions and a supply risk at a major mine in Chile. Uh, on the other hand, aluminium, zinc and lead all ended the day lower. Uh, similarly, spot gold prices they uh, they slipped for a third time this week ending three tenths of a percent uh, lower on account of easing trade war tensions between US and China thanks so much for that Yash well the telecom tribunal has rejected the sector regulators order that had changed the definition of significant market power uh, to identify predatory pricing offering huge relief to India's incumbent carriers who had said that uh, the new rules only benefited Reliance Geo my colleague Arpan Chaturvedi sums up all the details in this report. Well, the TDSAT judgment has come on petitions which were filed by Bharti, Airtel, Idea and Vodafone. And uh, one of the main grounds of challenge in this petition was the definition of, uh, of significant market player that was uh, laid down by the TRAI in its tariff order of February 2018. Uh, the, uh, the TDSAT has said that uh, the definition laid down by TRAI is subjective. And why is, the, uh, why is this particular definition important is because uh, when the TRAI or the TDSAT uh, decide on the aspect that whether a, a telecom service provider has been indulging in predatory pricing, they have to first determine whether uh, it is a significant uh, market player in that particular area where, where this question is being decided. Uh, apart from that, of course, there was also a challenge to discounted tariffs, uh, which basically, according to the TRI order of uh, February 18, meant that uh, if a telecom uh, service provider is giving discount to individual customers, the details of that have to be uploaded on the website. Uh, uh, apart from that, the TRI, uh, the TDSAT has also uh, raised question on the consultation process that was adopted. Uh, before this tariff order was passed, uh, the TRI has, or the TD side has said that uh, this particular consultation was incomplete. Uh, uh, in, in its final order, of course, uh, the TD side has asked the TRI to uh, come up again uh, with with the tariff order norms and has given six months to it. Uh, apart from that, of course, it has also uh, placed a bar that uh, no penalty would be levied on any telecom service provider uh, on the basis of the tariff order of uh, February 2018. Now, Shakti Kanta Das's first test comes today when the central bank's board is due to meet. The government is expected to push for tighter supervision of the RBI, including setting up committees to have oversight over various functions. Bloomberg's Heidi Stroud Watts and Sherry Ahn spoke to Sonal Varma of Anumura earlier today. She believes regulatory policies under Shakti Kanta Das's governorship will be more sympathetic to the government's arguments. Here's a slice of that conversation. 
I think, uh, you know, as far as the uh, central bank independence is concerned, uh, that is something that uh, we will see over a period of time. We've had a number of finance ministry bureaucrats uh, who, and their credibility and independence was initially questioned, but RBI as an institution has managed uh, to retain the credibility and independence over a period of time. So I think one should not prejudge. Uh, but specifically on this uh, new governor, I think there are two aspects. One is the monetary policy aspect, and second is the regulatory policy aspect. Aspect. As far as the monetary policy aspect is concerned, the decisions are now made by the monetary policy committee. So the new governor, we do think, has a neutral to a dovish bias on monetary policy, uh, but the decision ultimately is driven by fundamentals, and that does point to a more accommodative uh, rate outlook. But as far as the regulatory policies are concerned, the uh, governor does play a fairly important role. And uh, on that aspect, you know, issues related to the banking sector, issues related to liquidity, uh, we do think that the new governor will be uh, more accommodative. Yeah, I mean, they've managed to maintain independence, but in, in the meanwhile, they've lost two central bank governors essentially for this reason, right? Do you expect that the pressure from the government will continue? Well, I think uh, on the uh, banking side, uh, you know, to be fair, both the Reserve Bank uh, and the government uh, have uh, equally important points to make. Uh, the economy has been hit by, I would say, you know, a credit shock. Uh, the banking system has been under pressure for many years now, and the non-banking uh, sector, which was sort of filling, it, filling in the void uh, that was left by the banking sector, has also been hit with a shock. So you have an economy which is sort of a credit-driven economy, which is seeing significant tightening in financial conditions and credit conditions. So the job, of course, of monetary policy authorities has to be to ensure uh, that policies uh, are more uh, counter-cyclical rather than uh, pro-cyclical. And uh, apart from regulatory policies, if, you know, the system as a whole requires more liquidity, then more liquidity needs to be provided. So I don't think it is fair, you know, to say that, you know, one is right, one is wrong. I think both have an equally important uh, point to make. Uh, we need to address the near-term concerns, we need to ensure that there is no credit risk event in the economy because of lack of liquidity, uh, but at the same time, uh, without uh, diluting uh, medium-term financial stability. You know, of course, we do not uh, want to uh, raise medium-term uh, financial st stability risks. Those fundamentals that you mentioned that could actually support a dovish tilt, this GTV chart on the Bloomberg showing inflation easing, boosting the case for easier rate policy. So what's the outlook for inflation and price pressures going forward into the new year, new year especially when you have oil prices fluctuating? You're right. I mean, the outlook uh, does look uh, quite benign, uh, as the new governor uh, acknowledged. Uh, oil prices have come off. Uh, food prices, in our view, are going to stay quite low, uh, because a lot of the cyclical forces do suggest uh, that. And I think the one concern that we have seen in 2018 has been very high core inflation. Uh, but given the demand side of the economy, uh, which we think growth is going to moderate uh, to 6, 6.5 percent in the next uh, 6 to 9 months, uh, even the demand side inflation pressure should come off. So we think inflation is going to stay around 4%, uh, which is the uh, Reserve Bank's uh, medium-term target. So the real rates right now in India are quite high, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, a cut in the RBS repo rate. But before that, a change in mm. the stance uh, back to neutral is what we are expecting. The state election results really were not as great as uh, Prime Minister Modi's party had expected. What impact will that have on economic policy next year? Well, there isn't much time left, honestly, and uh, the government uh, doesn't have uh, enough money. They're already struggling on the fiscal front. Um, clearly, from the BJP's perspective, the question is uh, whether there uh, something needs to be done uh, on the rural economy to sort of assuage the rural voters. Uh, but that essentially means sort of a quick fix. Uh, there are talks of a farm loan waiver. Uh, like I said, the government does not have the money, uh, but an announcement on that front uh, 
could be there, uh, but I think that would endanger uh, macro uh, risks. Uh, but I think more than that, if the state election uh, results have really enthused the uh, opposition uh, and a grand coalition led by the Congress and a lot of disparate uh, regional parties uh, is something uh, that we will see. So uh, we do think that uh, political uncertainty will rise. And from an economic perspective, uh, that also means uh, weaker investment. And that's also one of the reasons uh, why we think uh, growth is going to slow down. Mm. All right, quite an insightful conversation there. Let's move on now and talk about the stocks in news. Nikki Merchandani is joining us uh, to tell you all about that. Good morning, Nikki. What are the stocks on your list today? Hi, Alex. I'm going to start off with IOC, which in, uh, yesterday evening came out with an announcement that the company is going to be buying back 3% of the total equity at a price of around 149 per share, which indicates a premium of uh, more than 9% from the closing price that we saw yesterday. Separately, it has also announced a dividend of 6.75 per share, which uh, indicates a dividend yield of around 5%. The record date both for buyback and dividend has been set as December 25th. Separately, we are also looking at Indian Energy Exchange, where the board is going to be meeting on December 20th to consider the buyback proposal by the company. LNT is also expected to be in focus given that the government said that it's likely going to be offering its shares in LNT buyback offer, which is estimated to be fetching around 700 crore. Uh, that's uh, a PTI exclusive that uh, PTI development that we have. Apart from that, we're looking at Madhasan Sumi, uh, where uh, the company is said to be in early talks with German-based Leone over a possible merger. The deal could be uh, worth more than 1.1 four billion dollars uh, separately nmdc has reported the monthly production as well as the sales number where the sales number of the company is up by 17 percent on month on month basis a positive development for the company dilip bilcon finally uh, a financial closure coming in for its ham project in madhya pradesh for a tune of around thousand four crore capital first which is uh, you know received uh, approval coming in from nclt for uh, the amalgamation of capital first and the two arms with IDFC Bank separately and lastly we're tracking in Bull Deal which is Max Financial Services where the promoter has sold in 1.86% equity in the company and the buyer is New York Life Insurance Company. All right, thanks so much for that Nikki. Now the Supreme Court will today announce a verdict on whether a court monitored probe into the multi-billion dollar Rafale fighter jet deal is needed. A bench headed by Chief Justice Ranjan Gogoi reserved its verdict uh, on November 14, that's today. The court will hear multiple petitions including those from former union ministers Yashwan Sinha and Arun Shori. The Rafale deal has been a key point of contention between the Congress and the BJP while the centre has defended the deal. The Congress used it as one of the key points during their campaigns in the recently concluded assembly elections in the five states. The verdict in uh, the uh, or the pronouncement of the verdict will happen at 10:30 this morning. All right, Samit Sarkar is standing by with the big brokerage calls of the day. Good morning, Samit. What do you have for us? Good morning, Alex. And the big brokerage calls for the day. First, we have the City on United Breweries. Now, the brokerage has initiated coverage on the stock with a buy rating and a target price of 1550. Now, according to the brokerage, in last decade, beer volume growth have exceeded that of Spirit. And going forward, also the value growth for beer is higher when compared to Spirits, as the market is still very small for beer, and there's a lot of growth potential going forward for this market. Now, the brokerage is expecting the industry volumes to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of 8% over, uh, over the medium terms is the brokerage. Now, the United Breweries has a strong competitive advantage according to the brokerage in form of its uh, dominant market share and on the back of its 21 own breweries. Now, along with this, the company's stride towards premiumization also provides a big opportunity for the company going forward. Lastly, the brokerage is expecting the company's EPS to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of 26% over FY18 to FY21. This is the highest growth rate among its peers. Second, we have is Deutsche Bank research on Larsen and Tubron. The brokerage has maintained its buy rating on the stock but has cut down the target price marginally to 1,620 from 1,650. Now, according to the brokerage, the new project announcement have fallen sharply, which would have a bearing on the new order inflows of the company over the next four quarters. And on the back of this, the brokerage has cut its target price and the order inflow guidance. Now, the brokerage also adds that the near term uh, to near to medium term order inflow uncertainty as well as the risk of political stability would be an overhang on the stock going forward. However, despite this, the broker still maintains its buy rating on the stock due to reasonable valuations and a likelihood of private capex recovery post the election period. 
Thanks so much for that, Somit. Now, after a two-day impasse, the Congress Party President Rahul Gandhi has picked veteran leader Kamal Nath to be the 18th Chief Minister of the state of Madhya Pradesh. The 72-year-old Nath was among the front-runners for the post, along with Jyotiraditya Sindhya. Nath is among the oldest members of the Congress Party, having been a nine-time MP from the Chindwara seat since 1980. Having been an aide to former Prime Minister late Rajiv Gandhi, Kamal Nath has served various ministerial posts in the central government as well. He has been uh, the Union Minister of State for Environment and Forest and the Minister of uh, Textiles during the Narsimha Rao government. He was also the Minister for Commerce and Industry during the UPA-1 under Manmohan Singh from 2009 to 2011. Nath was Minister for Road Transport and Highways and lastly took up the role of Urban Development Minister from 2011. Now, while Madhya Pradesh has found its new chief minister, there has been no such luck so far for Chhattisgarh and Rajasthan. The Congress Party's deliberations over who will be the chief minister for these two states will enter the third day today. In Rajasthan, supporters of both Sachin Pilot and Ashok Gilot in, in, indulge in violence on uh, the Jaipur Alwar Highway. Both leaders had to resort to Twitter to appeal for calm. Meanwhile, Rahul Gandhi will also be picking the chief minister for Chhattisgarh. State Party President Bhupesh Bhagel uh, and the state's richest candidate uh, T.S. Singh Deo are in the fray for the coveted post. Now, there's clearly lots to talk about over the course of the day. You'll find, of course, all the live market action right here on BloombergQuint.com, but also several stories that you should consider reading as of now. First up, Yes Bank is yet to select a candidate to succeed its chief executive officer, Rana Kapoor, and will submit a name to the central bank only after the 9th of January. The bank has shortlisted candidates for the post, but will zero in on one in its next board meeting in January, it said in an exchange filing. And foreign lender Standard Chartered Bank, which has significant retail operations in India, is downsizing across its retail banking division as more and more customers move online. Bloomberg Quint has reported that the bank will let go of about 200 staff members, mostly in branch banking operations. Well, that's all we have for you in this edition of Daybreak, but all you need to know is up next. So do stay tuned. This is Bloomberg Quint.